So I'd like to welcome Pat to the first webinar that we've had in 2022-2023. Um, we talked about it on our operational meetings and we kind of decided that rightly or wrongly that maybe everybody was zoomed out after all of the COVID um, meetings etc and decided not to do anything but then as the season the actual on ice season wound down we decided it was time to do something and rock matching was on my list of interesting topics so um, I would like to welcome Pat and you all know Pat Pat is a Canadian champion, a world champion, and now he is the director of high performance for uh, Curl Saskatchewan. So uh, Pat and I were back and forth a little bit with email and decided that rather than you can use the chat box to ask questions if you like, and I will keep an eye on that. However, if you'd like to unmute at any point during Pat's talk, then please do and ask away or make comments and, um, Pat's quite willing to entertain your questions as the pro as the presentation goes along rather than waiting to the end. So I think that's it. Thank you so much, Pat, for doing this for us. <laughs> well, th thank you. Um, so yeah, my my apologies. You're going to find out how I operate completely and fully flustered tonight. <laughs> that's for darn sure. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I was just actually in a team meeting and I thought, and they had they had contacted me today and and said, well, how does 4:45 work? And I say, oh, that no, that works great because I got an I'll have an hour and a little bit to get through that, and apparently not. So. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, and and uh, yeah, my, apo my apologies for being like, that's not my normal practice for sure. So, so and thank you, Andrea, for having me. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk a little bit about matching stones and, and kind of I added a bit the managing part of that to this. Um, you know, I kind of started thinking about this and, and it's obviously the timing is good because we're seeing, you know, we're seeing you know, some comments and references made at the, at the men's world championships right now. And it's, it's pretty interesting. And, and, you know, knowing that, knowing that we were going to talk about this, it's, you kind of key in on some of that stuff and it, uh, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to hear and, and interesting to hear uh, the team kind of on the live mics and talking about some of these things that, you know, we'll maybe be able to hit on a little bit tonight. So, so we'll kind of go through that. Um, definitely, if you have any questions, ask away and, and Andrea, I'll let you kind of manage that part of it, but um, absolutely, definitely, definitely I'm all for just stopping and answering at or, or as close to the time as possible, just because um, I find with this, especially with a topic like this, you can kind of get lost in different avenues and, and directions and whatnot. So, so yeah, by all means, any questions, fire away. We'll we'll do our best and and uh, and yeah, definitely don't hesitate with that. Um, and I'll I'll stop a few times too, just to to see how everyone's doing on that front uh, as well as we as we go, basically. So, all right, so. Um, what we'll try and cover tonight is, is uh, you know, a, a few different things, obviously kind of the detection of, of the whole, you know, the whole thought of matching stones, basically. So the detection piece, how to, um, and, and as it relates to things like a pre-competition um, practice or just your practice, your team's practice or individual practice in general, um, pre-game practices, game, and, and, you know, if you're at an event where you're actually trying to get information either from other teams or scout or whatnot to try and get a leg up on on some rock information, we'll just have a little ch a chat about that as well. Uh, potential differences um, and, and what that looks like with what you can find. Um, we'll spend just a little bit of time on that. Um, sometimes that's pretty self-explanatory, but we'll spend just a little bit of time on that. And then kind of the management piece. So, you know, I kind of group this into, you know, the mindset or, or a mindset maybe to, to take forward with, with this, um, uh, kind of who and when, so, you know, who gets, um, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, manage that whole side of things, uh, when, when you throw certain ones, uh, when you have done the detection piece and things of that nature, um, then tr kind of tracking and verifying that and then we'll just kind of touch a little bit on the kind of the stones versus the ice part as well which is obviously 
um, also important with, uh, with all of this, basically. So, okay, so the detection piece, and, and we'll kind of go through this uh, a little bit here too, but, you know, like, like so many things with, with our great sport, obviously, um, this, this too, when it comes to matching stones and, and getting good at it, uh, really kind of comes down to technical ability and technical excellence, right? So um, how, how good are you at um, throwing on the same line with the same weight and, and, you know, roughly the same amount of rotation, right, is what it kind of boils down to. Uh, and so much, so much falls back to that, you know, and we'll come as we go through this, we'll come full circle to that. But that part is, is absolutely vital. Um, the, the continuing development and, and fine tuning and, and ability to strive kind of towards um, as, as technically excellent or consistent um, as you can be. And, and maybe not even that, also aware, uh, technically aware. Um, just that's that's so important um and and uh with the with the whole topic of matching stones it's it's every bit if not uh more important as well with that so um consistent or equal line weight and rotation um leading to the stones coming to rest in roughly the same location you would kind of then at that point consider that they are somewhat matched basically right or or close to the same um, predictable and so on and so forth. So that's, that's kind of what you're going off of with that. Um, and again, with so many factors involved with this, um, the technical consistency is, is paramount or at least, um, the, the wherewithal to, you know, have the awareness of kind of how you're throwing and, and how you just threw and so on and so forth as well. So, really, really important because there are a lot of other factors that uh, still make it really difficult to, to get good at even the detection part of, of you know, learning your, learning your rocks that you're playing with, basically. So strive for technical excellence. Um, practicing um, matching stones, um, in my opinion, helps facilitate your journey towards this as well. So it kind of works, they, they work hand in hand in that sense. Um, you know, as well as being a very useful tool for, you know, weight control, body, uh, body and weight awareness and, and just fine tuning technically in general. So, you know, I think putting some of your, the, the matching rock skills into place is actually going to help the technical and obviously the technical helps it. They kind of go hand in hand a lot of, in a lot of cases. And, and I think it's something that, probably is, is far underutilized or definitely not practiced near enough um, uh, by teams and, and certainly individually as well, for sure. So um, important, important there, definitely. So um, basically then we're, you know, we start thinking about, well, how to then, like how, how do we, you know, how do we kind of go about, you know, matching a set of rocks or R2 rocks or whatever the case may be basically. And, you know, we can kind of break that down into, you know, if you're alone on your own, if you've got a partner or if it's the whole team kind of involved, basically. But um, and I think there are, you know, there are different ways of, of doing this. And I'll kind of relay kind of what, you know, my experience with it has been, basically. But certainly, you know, I think there are different uh, ways and, and methods of, of doing this for sure. Um, I personally, um, you know, and, and in the teams that I was with, um, would, you know, look at throwing through either stones or like cones work better. Sometimes it's a little safer as well, depending on, you know, kind of your level of team and so on and so forth. But having a set of uh, either the rocks or the cones that are just beyond where you'd release, kind of just beyond the hog line, some people will line up some more, um, you know, even even um, further, like closer to the hack um, along the slide or line of delivery as well. So um, can do that um, if you want kind of um, input or, uh, um, you know, that reference, I guess, all the way out in your line of delivery. Uh, certainly um, the ones at the end are very important um, to, to kind of, again, have that reference point, basically, as you're, as you're basically in essence, throwing through them and, sl and 
sliding through as well um, with that. So, and 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 another another good little tool with that is is um, you know having a cone or, or it might be another rock again you know kind of two thirds of the way down the ice just as a as a check for break point as well right so um, you know kind of a, a, another visual that helps um, see you know is the rock kind of at that point of the sheet kind of going across the same area uh, same place or not. Um, and what that looks like as well um, until it actually comes to rest and you can kind of see them, you know, stacking one on top of, of, of another, um, assuming everything is good, assuming the, the line um, is good, the weight's good, and the rotation is, is relatively close, obviously, as well. So, um, so need, uh, from an alone standpoint, uh, need to do this a lot. Like, this is something that actually should be done alone a lot. Um, I know sometimes teams that are actually all have the luxury of being all together in the same place. Um, I sometimes find with those teams, the challenge is actually doing this stuff on your own and actually getting the reps in alone with, uh, with a drill like this or something like this where you're actually going out and trying to match, you know, maybe it's all eight stones or, or, you know, half a set or, or even just your two, right? So, um, so really important one to do, really important to do it alone a lot, because I think then you get the number of reps and in the time proximity that you actually need to, to make improvements and get better at this, basically, um, where that can be a challenge when you're actually, you know, all practicing with the team. Um, Obviously, when you have, uh, you know, when you have more people on board, you can have, you know, a, a, a target holder that, you know, maybe the, the broom is held, you know, in between the rocks, just as a bit of more of a guide. Um, some people will go a little further down the ice as well with a target. Uh, that's perfectly fine as well. No right or wrong with that. It's just what makes it easier to kind of see and, and be able to go at that line as consistently as possible. With a full team, you can even have a brush down on, you know, kind of cleaning these rocks and, and uh, you know, avoid any problems that way as they kind of travel and come to rest. So, and then a, another part of the tool, obviously we've got the line part uh, there, but another part of that tool is obviously the speed and, and uh, you know, of course being alone, tough to, tough to time, you've got kind of your feel. Um, and that's where kind of one, you know, if you've got a, a, a speed trap, one beam, um, of the speed trap just to measure a speed um, is a really good a really good tool as well and it's something that you're completely hands off and can kind of have a glance at and reconfirm maybe to your feel or what you felt um, and and then make sense of of what you see at the other end with where they come to, to rest as well so so that that beam would be kind of you know, beyond the, uh, the, uh, a little bit, the area with which you'd slide to, um, you know, it might be 10 feet from the hog line or thereabouts. Um, and you're just basically measuring a speed. It's not a, it's not a split. It's, it's not a hog to hog. It's basically just a speed or a number, um, that, uh, you can compare rock to rock to rock to basically as well. So, so yeah, that's that those in a nutshell, um, that, seems to work pretty darn good uh, to um, get the line reference right. Um, you've got the speed component if you need. Um, and, and the beam even works with, with the full team as well. Um, you know, if you're not wanting to, if you're wanting to kind of take the, the timing or the potential user error of the stopwatch out of play and things of that nature. So um, good, way to, good way to go about that. Um, and, and like I say, that can be, those are, those are exercises that can be done with full team, uh, part team, and certainly should be done individually um, to, uh, to get better at it and to even, again, fine tune, um, you know, even coming up to an event, fine tune the practice of this, fine tune, you know, small weight differences in what you're feeling and things of that nature uh, as you prepare for for certain events basically so questions i'll stop there for just a second questions on any of that so far kind of the detection piece from that standpoint 
I, I didn't understand the speed trap. For sure, for sure. So, so the speed traps are just, um, it's like a laser. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about the Rock Hawk ones, I guess. They're probably the most common ones, but it's basically just two little, um, two little devices you set on each side of the sheet. And it shoots a little laser across and, and basically it measures as the rock or, or anything goes through it, it'll measure the, the velocity that it was going through it at. Um, so that's nice, it's handy because basically you can put it, um, you know, like I say, 10 feet or so from the near hog line where you're throwing. And after you throw through, you know, your set of cones or, or rocks or whatever the case may be, um, you'll get a number on, on your phone or an iPad that's connected to it. You'll actually get a number on the screen. And so you'll have a, an instant reference of kind of how fast the rock is going, basically, which is really useful because, you know, that'll kind of help you determine, you know, okay, should this rock be perfectly frozen on the one I just threw before? Or, you know, was I a little heavier or was I lighter? And, and then kind of make sense of, where those rocks end up, basically. Um, Pat, yep. we have a we have a question about the beam, about one ah. beam. What do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah, that's just the one. That's so the the um, the the um, rock hawks, for example, the the uh, speed trap kind of devices. Um, you can use two or even three at times. Um, different. You can set them up in different ways. So you can do like hog to hog, for instance, and measure those times for you where, where you have, you know, you'd have two at one hog line, two at another. And as the rock travels through uh, both, it'll give you like a hog to hog time, for instance. So, uh, and you can do split times as well. You can do a bit of both even as well. So uh, what I mean by one beam is, is just the, you basically just have the two with one. It's basically just measuring the, the speed. There's no, time involved um other than just the speed that it gives you so so is, is i'm familiar with one which uh, basically by knowing the the size of a rock as the rock goes by that's how it uh, calculates the speed is the one you're talking about similar yeah it just measures the velocity of it exactly yeah it just yeah. measures the velocity as you go through and and you could do you could do it you sliding through um it'll go off if you just you know you're you're brushing and kind of go go through it by accident even like it'll measure all those speeds basically as you go through so um so you do want it you know you want it kind of you know to the point where you're not going to slide necessarily through or or mess with it that way but that um that it's close to it's close to where you've released it to, to, to get that um, true speed, so to speak. And then, the really, yeah, sorry, go I, ahead. I, I'm just saying the one I'm familiar with is called Chrono Curl. It comes out of Quebec somewhere. Okay, yeah, yeah. There are different times. There are, there, there are different kinds of those I, I know I've seen as well. So um, I think the Rock Ox are pretty popular. Um, and then they just hook up to a device. Um, there are others that come with a like a clock, and and same thing. They'll they'll kind of um, you know connect each other across the sheet and and uh, create that uh, create that trap or that laser whereby it'll it'll do measurements for you as well for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously with this, you know, what's really important is to watch where the rocks end up, right? Um, pay attention to that and then ask yourself, you know, does that make sense with the line I threw it at, with the weight I threw it at, with the weight I'm seeing that's verified by the device um, that's measuring it, uh, you know, and, and basically starting to put all, that all together as well, right? Um, you know, and, and the nice thing about, you know, the cones or sliding through cones or rocks or things like that is, is um, you get that, you get some feedback on that uh, as well. It's not just, you know, picking a target at the other end of the sheet and, and having a go at that. You'll get feedback on that immediately. So, you know, if you're, if you're sliding out in your lines, you know, you're fighting to kind of get it through, or maybe you have to adjust your release to actually throw it through your cones. Well, that's obviously going to have an impact then on how it travels uh, line-wise, right? So um, it's it's a it's a great way to 
to do it, to do the, the matching or the practice of the matching. Um, but it's also a great way to, you know, continue to gain and develop the body awareness of, of, you know, how you're actually throwing it and, and um, you know, why certain things happened uh, the way they do basically as well. Um, when you have that, when you have that feedback uh, versus a game, for instance, where, you know, it's more wide open. You don't have feedback at multiple areas along the sheet as much uh, as you would with this. So, Another question we have here, won't backline to hog give the curlers more information? Um, for example, aiming for 3.8 or whatever? Yeah, so that's a, that's a split. So um, for matching rocks, I would say, I would argue, no, it won't. Um, I mean, it's we, we don't have these devices out when we're playing, right? So obviously then we rely on splits and hog to hogs and we can get into that a little bit as well. But um, the problem with a split is um, you can still add or subtract on release, right? And so um, therefore, you know, we still have that unknown potentially, um, which could, you know, lead to not knowing for sure if the rocks, you know, should have ended up where they did or not necessarily, if that makes sense. Uh, whereas just the speed of the rock kind of is just the speed of the rock. There's no, like it's, you know, how you release it. And if you add or subtract or whatever, well, that'll show up on the speed basically. Um, whereas stuff like that doesn't necessarily on the split times. Good question. Mm -hmm. Anything else on that piece at all? Not seeing anything else in the chat other than if people want to um, write down the link. Steve shared the link for Rock Hawks and uh, Daniel shared the link for Chrono Curls. So if you want to see those, write those down, um, have a look in the chat. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So, yeah. So, okay. So, carrying on through the detection piece. So, obviously, um, you know, we can practice this, should practice this. Uh, and, you know, what we're seeing now on this slide are the reasons we, we kind of want to practice this and get, get better at, um, at this, obviously, right? And, and, you know, more and more important as your teams continue to develop and, and uh, you know, gain this awareness and, and build these skills, basically, um, for sure. So now we get to an event where, you know, there might be a pre-competition practice, which, you know, that'll happen that, you know, U18s and, and junior nationals and things of that nature uh, might even at uh, some of the provincial championships, obviously, as well. So, um, so what, what can you do then that, uh, that applies to kind of the matching of the stones? And, and so what I, what I would say with this is, um, you know, a lot of times what teams will do uh, here is you know look and see where kind of the first game or maybe the first couple games are um and some sometimes the colors are even predetermined right so you might even know the set of rocks that you're you're actually going to be playing with for the first game or or two as it as it were um and and that might be an instance where you know for the for the first sheet or or two up to you um you may that might be what you do in your pre-competition practice on that sheet is, is this very exercise of everyone checking the rocks, um, you know, getting comfortable with that, seeing, seeing what they look like, um, you know, and, and you get more out of just the matching part as well, but, uh, but certainly going into that first game and feeling good about, you know, the two rocks you're throwing and, and everyone feels pretty good about uh, all of them is, is a powerful thing and a good thing, obviously, and a positive for sure. So, Typically with, with these practices, you get, you know, you might get 10, some, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 15 minutes, depending on the, the event and whatnot, um, which is um, enough time. It goes, it goes quick. It's, it's, it's hard to believe how quick that 10 minutes can go when you're, when you're moving around a lot, but, um, but still a good, a good idea for sure. So, and again, you can do this in much the same way. Um, it might be more of a, a target. Um, whether you use cones or not, you might not in this case because you don't want to have the, the whole cleanup necessarily when you're shifting sheets and, and, and in a bit more of a time crunch that way. But certainly teams will use uh, uh, a speed trap sometimes. 
um, or you might rely a little more on just the, the regular timing and 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 the, the feedback from your your athletes as well in that sense as, as well um, and and a target room obviously too right so um, uh, and then just again really paying attention to to kind of where those rocks and, and whatnot come to rest for sure so um, some teams may, may, you know, may, you may be going to an event where you actually already have some rock information um, from a previous event. And, and um, that I would say, I would say, you know, the, the, the thing about that is, um, you know, that may help with you deciding maybe how you, you know, dictate who maybe throws which rocks within the pre-competition practice on the sheet, on, on the sheet that you might you know, check or try and match your stones for your first game. Um, but I would, I would argue and I kind of urge you to keep a really open mind on, on any information that you have or know with respect to this. Uh, and don't bias your judgment for, for the event that you're actually about to start. Um, you know, I think just have an open mind, you know, yes, you know, you know, you're throwing these two, you're throwing these two, you're throwing these two, but really do your due diligence and kind of check again. Uh, and then after the fact, um, based on what you see, uh, or if you find anything out or do any detecting of, of anything, um, then you can cross reference after the fact. Um, and, and really, you know, quite simply, the reason being is that those things can change a lot. Um, you know, rocks that you know, may have been labeled as something, you know, previously, obviously, you know, may not be, or, or that could have certainly changed, um, and often is the case. So, uh, and also, you know, I find even having a little bit of that bias sometimes just, you know, you almost, you almost hope that that's the case and, and, and end up thinking it's the case when it may not be. Um, so I think having an open mind and, and, you know, redoing, resetting, and then believing kind of what you see when, when, um, you know, your athletes are at a stage where, where they become fairly competent at doing this is, is a, a great kind of approach, um, especially in a pre-competition practice with that. And then pre-game practices. So these are the ones that, you know, obviously where you're, you're out practicing and you, you throw your, your last stone draws for, for, you know, for hammer before a game and things of that nature. And, and obviously, you know, one of the goals in the pre-game practice, of course, uh, you know, the biggest may be trying to win hammer and, and certainly getting a feel for, you know, what normal draw weight to the T line is, uh, would be, would be up there. And so too should be, you know, checking your rocks and, and making sure that, you know, everything looks okay on that end of things for you just before your game. So, um, so I would say stone information in a pregame practice, it, it uh, would say it becomes more important as the, as your teams age or become more competent technically, um, you know, withdraw weight with ice reading, uh, and with their ability to detect outlier stones and, and, uh, recognize abnormal from normal basically so um you know, maybe maybe you know i guess again when there's less importance on actually mapping the sheet or you know knowing what you know hit's going to do here and things of that nature so really really dependent probably on the age and stage of of the teams obviously in that case um for sure and and you know i'm, I'm a big believer that that um you know, again, so many factors involved that even in the pregame practice, you know, throwing your two rocks kind of away and back um, at, a, at a very similar or the same target um, both times, I think is really important. Like, I really do think you need, you know, both those times where you, where you really see it. Um, I would, I would say like, still it's tough, right? Like still it's tough, you know, when you're, when you still think you're throwing really well and you think you've thrown you know, very much the same weight, um, you know, seeing that twice is, is, you know, vitally important. Um, and, and then, you know, making sense of it or feeling good about what you've seen or, or noticing something twice. Right. And, and, uh, and being able to have that conversation about, you know, how you're then going to manage and, and deal with what you've seen basically. So, um, 
So yeah, it really important. Uh, this is something that obviously the person throwing has has to be very cognizant of. Maybe your you know the broom holder, or if you 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 kind of partner up in these pregame practices, kind of your your partner that maybe is doing a little brushing for you or whatnot during your shots. Uh, this is this is all players on board to try and help um, you know detect and determine with with this case. Um, so often I see with these pregame practices, so often I see teams kind of just throw them and not really pay attention to where they may stop or where they end up um, and things of that nature. And, and just missing such an opportunity to do some learning on, on your stones, right? And, 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 and what they look like and, and you know how they react basically. So, uh, so you all have to promise me that you're not gonna do that because that drives me nuts. I think when, when people are just kind of throwing just to throw and, and not getting as much out of, especially a pregame practice as they could so easily be doing basically with that, right? So. We have a couple of questions that um, sure. go back to pregame practice. Yeah. Um, did your pregame practice include matching rocks or did you do that exclusively pre-event and during the late night practices other than during the game, of course? Yeah, great question. So you try and you try and check and recheck as much as you can. Um, you certainly, you know, having some information before the event, great, a starting point, but that's all it is. Um, uh, this is a very, you know, living fluid kind of document that you're tracking and creating and so many things can change with so many factors. So, so pre-competition practice, yes, you might check, but you probably are only checking, like I say, maybe, you know, one game in or maybe yeah. two at the very, very most. That's it. You know, then, uh, then you're relying on, you know, information you're gathering from maybe a couple other teams that you trust. Um, you're, you're relying on, you know, your pregame practice sometimes is, you know, might be the first go at these rocks that you're getting as well. So I think, yeah, pregame practice is a really important time to just verify, check and verify. And, you know, sometimes detecting happens then too, for sure. Sometimes it unfortunately doesn't happen then it happens during the game. Uh, but you'd love it to happen before a game, obviously, so you know what you're dealing with. That's kind of the goal with rocks uh, and, and matching rocks, for sure. Um, doesn't always happen even to the best teams, as we're seeing this week. Um, you know, it it's sometimes is, is a really difficult and tall order, but, but we have to do our best. And that always should be the goal, is to know what you're dealing with before the start of every game. So, so another so, question to hmm. uh, pre-comp practice. Um, sometimes you're on a sheet of ice for your pre-competition practice where you're throwing both sets of rocks. Sometimes you only get one set of rocks on that sheet, but would you prioritize matching the back end rocks or do you still continue matching the whole set? Yeah, really good question. So the pre-comp practice, typically you can do what you like. Um, you can, you can use one set, both sets, a mix and match, you know, it, Usually you have your, your choice of that. So, so if you get to a sheet that's, you know, game one and your goal on that sheet is to check those rocks, um, just use your rocks, just use your color, obviously. And I think it's a great idea to start from skip and work down because, and the reason for that is, um, you know, I've been burnt by this before. Um, you find some things out, you recheck, you got to throw a few over again, you know, that you didn't like the way you threw. Um, these things happen and you can get to 10 minutes and all of a sudden, you know, if you're going the other way, you might've only got to, you know, halfway through the thirds rocks. Right. So I would say start at the, at the two that you're thinking the skip might throw and then work your way down. And that's not, that's not to say that any of them are less or more important than the others for sure. Um, uh, but I think, you know, we can probably all agree that the skip rocks, if you haven't got those figured out, they're going to go on the scoreboard immediately. Whereas, you know, at least you've got some, some leeway with, with some of the other ones. So that, that's how I would do it. Um, you know, you hope you get through all of them, but yeah, great question on, on kind of the, the order to do that for sure. Do you have, sorry, Pat, do you have a standard form you use to track the rocks? 
I just write, I just write stuff down. Like that would be kind of just in the, in the, the event rock book that I would do. Right. So I would have, um, uh, you know, um, you know, sheet and, and, you know, all the numbers and, you know, kind of what we're finding room for comments on each. Basically I do it kind of the old fashioned way personally, but I've seen lots where people just make a spreadsheet of, of sheet and colors and, and numbers as well. And that works great too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. you bet. Sorry, Pat to interrupt and go back to the last point. Yeah. Are you okay? So, so aren't you throwing the rocks that are matched first though? Right. So let's say you only get time to match eight, seven, six, five, or one, two, three, four. Aren't you presupposing then that if you are guaranteed a match set that you as a backend player are going to throw those first, regardless mm. of the rock number? Sorry, not sure. Um, so, but you, so you can throw like typically as a team, you can, of those eight rocks, anyone can throw anything, right? No, absolutely. But what I'm saying is if you only spend time matching four rocks in your 10 minute practice, you as a back end player would throw those matched rocks prior to throwing unmatched rocks. Oh, possibly so. Yeah, possibly so. I, I think it's more if you have, you know, if you, if you have some information and whatnot, um, I, I would just do it that way. I would just uh, do it where, you know, skipper would be first up, here are your two rocks, third would go, uh, and then kind of go that way. For sure, if that happened, you would probably do that, definitely. But what I will mention, though, is you want to, like, every player needs to throw their rocks because what might be a matched two rocks for one person may not be for another um that's that's for certain right just based on again factors different way of throwing things of that nature for sure so but yeah i think it's that that just comment is just uh, around the fact that um would 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 have you know maybe skip go first in that process and then work work down or it might be skipping third alternating kind of and like typically that's what works best because then you can you can get a little bit more done um, quicker and then, you know, hopefully get through everyone for sure. We have another question about pregame practice. How do you know that the rock is, isn't matched versus um, an inconsistency in the ice uh, that early on? How, how do you differentiate? Really, yeah, so really good. Um, because you the ice is important. We're gonna talk about that, but the ice part is vital, you know, being being able to ice read and, and having an idea of, of the sheet and, and have that mapped out. And if there's any tendencies or intricacies with respect to the sheet of ice in general, um super, super important to know and figure out, right? Because you're exactly right. It can be the ice too. And if there's a you know, if there's a bit of a high center line or four foot line or a little ridge here or something going on, um, you can be close to the same line and have a quite a different outcome at the other end for sure. So, so figuring out that and mapping that sheet of ice is, is massively important. Um, uh, so that piece has to be in play basically. Um, in a pregame practice, it, you know, hopefully, Certainly as the event goes on, you should have a pretty good idea for sure. Hopefully the ice isn't changing that drastically with every different sheet that you go on. Um, hopefully it's, it's, it obviously can happen. Right. And then that just makes it more difficult to do simple as that, because like you say, um, the ice qualities could have an impact on things hundred percent. We have another quick question, yeah. Pat. If two rocks are matched on draw weight, can you assume they're matched on takeout weight? Yeah, good question. I think so. Like, I think that's fair to say for sure, because the differences will be amplified with draw weight uh, on, on, um, on, on the rock and the matching of those two rocks as, as well, for sure. So, so there should be a greater difference on, on the draw weight in that sense uh, than you would see on hits for sure. Yeah. Okay, good. How are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have some questions about papering rocks, but I thought maybe I'd wait with those until you get into the game situations, the game detection, because you sure. might cover it there anyway. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. So 
Yeah. Okay. So then we get, you know, then we get into the game, right? And and um, you know, the few, the few points that I wanted to make because, like I say, the goal is to know as much about your rocks as you can um, before the game. However, um, it's important to be, you know, very aware during the game as well. Um, so take advantage of situations, um, you know, in which you may throw the same shot twice or, or even more so if it's a back-to-back -back shot, obviously. Uh, those are great opportunities to, again, recheck, verify, you know, know what you're dealing with and, and, uh, and obviously helps, helps just to reconfirm the information about, uh, about the stones that you're throwing. Um, but here's the deal, like you can have, you, there are changes that can occur as the game progresses even, right? So just because you've got things figured out in the pregame practice now doesn't mean that it's going to act that way all the way through the game necessarily either, um, which is which is the tough part. So you know, the quality of the stone may show up uh, or certain qualities of a stone may show up that didn't uh, previous, you know, before the ice maybe say started to flatten or or get worn in a little bit with, with the amount of brushing in certain paths um, and things of that nature. So have to have to be aware of that too and have to just always be, you know, watching and believing what you see and learning as even the game goes on basically. Um, and keep an eye on the opposition patterns, characteristics as well. Um, you know, again, th this stuff is more pertinent the more advanced the team is and, and becomes and, and develops uh, obviously but uh yeah really important because those changes can can even occur within the game and often do occur within the game um uh, as well for sure and then as far as the scouting goes um you know you know this is where you're kind of you know trying to get some information or maybe some help from from teams that are or players teams whatever the case may be that you know, you've deemed that you you think are good at this or you trust or whatnot as well in that sense with the rocks. So, you know, watch for orders changing during a game from, from another team um, if you're charting. Um, you know, thrower, you know, thrower maybe grabbing a different rock for different shot, right? You see that lots when you're at events where they may, you know, have a rock out and switch, switch based on the shot that's coming as well. Um, just again, patterns or, or, you know, watching things like, um, like uncharacteristic misses even, right. Uh, I know, you know, when I, when I was skipping, you know, you, you know, you, you kind of see people throw, you obviously get to watch them throw a little closer. And, and when you start seeing, you know, you know, someone coming up light, that's just a really, you know, uncharacteristic or it's happening a number of times or things like that, it just starts, should start to, to, you know, ring a warning bell uh, somewhere whereby you're, you're starting to think about, you know, well, what's going on here? What's, you know, is, is again, ice versus rocks and so on and so forth there. So I think that uh, showed up today. Yeah. Yeah. In today's game with, uh, was it AJ, AJ's rock? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 There's been quite a bit of talk of that this, this week, which has been kind of interesting to follow and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, doing some good detecting and then sometimes actually, you know, obviously having to learn during the game as well, which, uh, which is tough and actually goes right to goes right to the point we had made about the changing conditions and, and different factors that can affect that for sure. So, so yeah, just all, all things to keep an eye on. And, and, uh, you know what, I, for you, for the coaches here, um, getting good at all this really important, but also I think, um, have a, consider having your players, you know, and maybe this is part of your post game debriefs and things of that nature, but consider having your players um, rate or rank the stones that they threw that game, Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, you know, based on kind of what they felt, how they played, you know, that may open up some discussion as far as, you know, certain shots in the game and, and you know, and kind of re reiterating maybe why or, or whatnot as well. But um it's a really good skill to kind of develop because as again, as your, your, your players get more advanced and better and you get into, you know, the men's and ladies and, and national championships and things, um, the whole, the whole new world of 
you know, selecting your rocks for playoffs comes into play, right? And, and you know, more practice time to verify those. And, and so keeping track of that is a really good skill, even at a young age, to start to develop um, and, and being able to select and pick and, and um, you know, and, uh, and go through that process, basically. So good, a good one to, uh, to get learning on uh, at an earlier age, for sure. And journaling, eh? Journaling all those rocks, rock situations. Yeah. Keep track. Yeah. Keep track of, of everything, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I used to have a rock book for every single event. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in some events where the rocks kind of went from event to event, like if it was a briar or whatnot, well, then it would be a, a rock book just on the set of rocks that were being used year after year. Right. So yeah, keep adding to it and, and, uh, you'll see, you'll see all this happening. You'll see changes and, and, differences and but you'll also see some similarities from year year in year out as well which you know as you go and as you gather information on all this and get really good at it um is a huge leg up can be a huge help obviously so so we have some questions about papering then how do you match stones after they paper the stones will they eventually revert back to their to their tendencies was one question mm -hmm. and uh sure. there was another one here so we'll start with that one. Um, sure, so good, yeah. So good question. So you match them the same way, like that, that doesn't change. What you see may be different, obviously, after the fact. Um, you know, papering stones basically is done to, you know, in, in a nutshell, basically to help promote a little bit more curl so the ice makers don't have to clip as much pebble off. Like that's kind of why that's done pre-event it's why some a lot of times it's, it's starting to be done kind of in the middle of events now too all the teams and players will be letting know that you know tuesday night they're gonna they're gonna you know do a little you know kind of re retexturing of the rocks again and and that's why is because they want some curl maintained all week and into the playoffs and not have to or not be at the expense of having to really clip a lot of pebble off the ice to maintain that curl so they don't lose the ice or so it doesn't you know flatten out terribly or they don't lose a lot of speed or start getting you know more picks basically during the game so that's that's the why behind that um and you, you match them the same way um sometimes the sometimes you know it's it's really a mix and mash sometimes those rocks are pretty similar you know sometimes they may in general just do a little bit more curling for a while sometimes those previous qualities that you had written down and and you had done all this work sometimes that will come back later on um, some things some qualities do carry right through that you can count on and sometimes not <laughs> so so really um, again, you kind of have a starting information, but you're re-verifying all this stuff again, pre-game practice, at night, um, all that stuff kind of takes place again, basically, right, with that, for sure. Um, how much of a difference can papering make? You know, if you've got two rocks that are matched, and then they're papered, is it possible that they will no longer be matched? Yeah, for sure it is, yeah. Yeah, because papering is a is a you know it's not done by machine, it's done by the the ice techs, right? And and so mm -hmm. they're good at it. They're very, very good at it. Um, there's not a lot to it when you watch, or you know, I've watched and I've actually, you know, done it once before as well. And and it's an interesting, you know, it's a you know, different people will do a little bit differently depending on how much they want to affect the rocks, obviously, but um but like anything, like anything, there can be human error. It can be done slightly differently um, to a to a slightly different degree and things like that. So yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, you may you may have two rocks that you, you know thought or you played with once before earlier in the week, and now all of a sudden, you know, maybe not quite the same. Hundred percent. There's another question here, Pat, about um, the pregame practice. And instead of trying to figure out what the ice is doing, should the should the the athletes be throwing two stones on the same line and draw weight only to match the stones, or should they be focused on what the ice is doing? Yeah, I, so good question. I think that really depends on kind of where the stage of your team, um, in my opinion, right? Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah. If you're, you know, the, the younger you are, I think the more the tendency is that, you know, you might gain more from learning the ice um, if that's still a bit of a challenge and, and, and so on and so forth, especially if you're, they're not technically um, proficient enough or at that stage where they're going to be able to pick up those differences in the rocks as well. Right. But um, soon as you are, and, and, you know, obviously the, the more developed those team teams are, um, they're, they're typically going to know or be able to really quickly figure the ice part out. Uh, and therefore, then more weight would be definitely put on the rock part of things, 100%. Um, you know, and if you watch, you know, the best teams, they're, you know, almost exclusively doing just that. Um, there's a few that will run a practice where they'll fire some hits there and back, but that's just to kind of, you know, throw a bit of weight, break it in, but they're still doing the the draws up and back kind of in, in similar paths as well after the fact. They've just gotten quick where they can add that. But yeah, the, the more the more advanced the teams to the to the ones that are the very best, they're doing that and, and more worried about the rocks, they'll have the ice figured out. Either they do already uh, or it will be in very short order kind of thing. So yeah. Good stuff. Any other questions, Andrea? Well, I just answered a couple of myself. I hope that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, somebody asked about binoculars, if that's what they're being used for is to um, see what other teams are throwing. And I said, yes, they're used for um, seeing what, what order they're throwing, but they could also be used for um, scouting opposition throw, throwing tendencies. And the other thing to, re to remember as a coach is if you're scouting – scouting rocks it's best to have somebody else do it for you somebody that you trust and that is knowledgeable um so that you're not missing what's going on in your own game am i right yeah yeah no 100 percent. like that's great um you can get when you when you've done it for a little bit you can actually kind of there's little tricks that you can do you can kind of get a lot during like the pre-game practices you know mm -hmm. you know potentially and things like that there's little tricks so you can actually get certain orders pretty quick but yeah you don't want to miss obviously what's going on in front of you for sure so um if you have extra help that's awesome and and those are things check a few times check initial order and then check kind of you know a little later in the game to make sure that hasn't changed as well for sure we have another question let's say you knew the rocks versus choice of hammer in a playoff game what's your evaluation slash math on what's worth more? Is it worth giving up hammer to get a, a set of rocks that you have confidence in or is it better to keep hammer? Well, yeah, almost <laughs> like almost always you're gonna keep hammer for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it, ha it, it has happened the other way, um, but you know, almost always it's, it's gonna be keeping the hammer. And I think the reason being is, um, you know, again, when, when we, when it's, when are, there are advanced teams getting into that situation, um, you know, the hammer's meaningful in the first end, you know, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, there sh should still be confidence in getting the rocks figured out. Now, would you like the other set? hundred percent for sure. <laughs> um, but obviously you can't have both always, right. Um, you know, and, unless you've, you've been free and clear and you happen to kind of get both, which is even better, but um, yeah, no. Yeah. And, and typically, you know, later in an event, you've probably played with a lot of, like, I know, you know, Scotty's and Briar and things uh, you have played with every, every set of rocks. Right. So it's not like you wouldn't know anything from them either. Um, so, but yeah, good question for sure. I think we're out of questions. Cool. Okay. So we'll, we'll kind of move on through here and, and just quickly go over kind of potential differences because they're, it's, they're pretty self-explanatory, but um, it, obviously you can pick up on, and when you detect things, um, when we're talking about line only differences, um, two choices, uh, you know, and we're, we're making reference to what we, what we kind of have established as the, the normal rock, right? So the normal amount of of curl, the normal speed and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, I, I, I say normal like this, I mean, it's, you know, every rock is probably slightly different, even if they, you know, you consider them match, there's, there's gonna be 
you know, tiny, small differences all the time with, with things, obviously. There's no absolutes with that. So, but line only, we're talking about obviously straight or more curl, basically. Okay, those would be the, the two possibilities of outliers there. Weight would be slower or faster, right? With respect to um, with respect to kind of a, a, a the normal speed, if you will. And then obviously you have certain rocks that can have both line and weight uh, issues kind of mixed in, right? So um, you know probably the most common ones, and and I know I'm I'm sure I've seen kind of a little bit of everything kind of over the years and and charted things that way. But straight and fast would be more common. A more common combination, slow and more curl would be a more common combination um, when their their line and the weight are affected with a certain stone. Um, I have seen straight and slow before, not very often. Um, it was interesting because we had one um, last year. Uh, there was one like that at our pre trials, and and I kind of it was it was like really noticeable, right? And and. Uh, it's, I kind of inquired about that. It sounded like it was just a, like a problem with the retexturing basically. So I, I thought that was interesting. It's something that if you do see something like that and, and you won't often, that's not a real common um, combination, but that's in that case, it was, it was sounded like it was something to do with that. Uh, and then fast and more curl, that's, that probably is really rare. Um, you know, certainly you can have rocks that curl more that you know, seem to hold up speed or seem to be a similar speed, but the, the, the more curl with a, you know, seemingly faster speed or, or slides further um, would not be common or very common at all, basically. So, so those would be kind of the, the possibilities for differences, I guess, with respect to that. Okay. And then, so now we've, you know, we've, done our due diligence we've gone through we've figured some stuff out uh, with respect to the rocks whether it be you know all the different you know uh, times that you can actually do that and verify all that stuff and then we kind of get to the management piece of it so now what basically so the first thing i want to just touch on is just general mindset of of the situation so um so once detected uh, rock outliers or abnormalities um don't have to be a, a, a problem, um, don't have to be thought of negatively necessarily. Um, they can in fact sometimes be an advantage um, when confident at managing that. So I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the fact that you've, you've figured something out, you know, you're all on board, this, this rock does this in comparison to normal. And, you know, it's, it, there's an instant negative connotation to that. Um, but the negative is when you don't detect it and get caught on it, right? But if you if you figured it out, um, all good, you know, you, you know, accept the challenge of that basically and how you're going to manage it. So I think that that goes a long way towards you know being better at managing it basically. Um, so line differences, like if it's a rock that you know does have a line difference as well. Um, ensure proper communication for, for these rocks that, that may have differences in line, whether they curl more or, or straighter. And just make sure <coughs> in that communication, just make sure that the thrower and, and uh, the, the skip are on the same page. So what you don't want to see there is, you know, both people compensating for that rock, right? So just know, know as a team, you know, how then you, you deal with that. Is it the skip kind of you know, taking that into consideration or is the thrower doing some of that or are you, you know, if you're both doing that, do, do we need that to be the case, right? So um, just make sure that line of communication is, is open and working properly. And then for weight differences, um, you know, try thinking, you know, try thinking in terms of where the aim point should be or needs to be versus kind of focusing or concentrating on the rock. So, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, uh, you know, rock that you've deemed as, you know, a whole six feet slower, for example, um, you know, and you want, you're trying to throw a rock top 12, well, you know, kind of aim, aim for that T-line weight basically, right? So just, again, it, that kind of fits in, the, you know, a bit more with the, with the mindset piece, but, um, you know, adjusting, adjusting versus, um, 
you know, focusing on the negative of, of the fact that the rock is different, basically, I think is, is the name of the game there for sure. Um, so next piece of the management, who gets the stones detected and when? Um, so I think, you know, I think there's a number of ways. I'll just throw a bunch of things at you guys as far as that goes, because I think there's a number of ways you can really look at this. Um, you know, one might be who's who manages the these stones the best who's best at, at handling them on the team uh you know if that's the case maybe that's maybe that's the right person um maybe it depends on on the stones and how they're different um you know that could be that could be a factor in deciding who gets you know is it are you just thinking positionally so is it is it always a, always front end for instance is it always the lead or the second in some cases and, and things of that nature um, you know, when you have multiple, you know, kind of outlier rocks or rocks that you've detected that may be, you know, different from the norm, basically, um, you know, if they're similar, maybe those get matched up together and given to, you know, somebody. Um, you know, I, I would urge you not to give, you know, if you've got two, two rocks in, a, in your set of eight that you're going to go play with, um, and you've, you know, you've got one straight fast and one slow and and curls a little bit more compared to the normal you know probably not the best idea to match those two up and give them to somebody because that's a wide wide range of spectrum without a lot of reference to what normal is for that that poor person to try and deal with right so so just have those thoughts in mind of you know what they are what you've seen and and then what how best to kind of massage them into the order to get the most out of, you know, not only the rocks, but the players throwing them and, and, uh, and so on and so forth there as well. So, um, so yeah, just, just food for thought on that. Different teams will, will handle this a little bit differently, probably um, with respect to, with respect to that. Uh, a straight rock, that, that's the one, that's the one that can be the most challenging, um, you know, and, and sometimes the most difficult. Um, you can always give more ice for a rock that curls more, but straight rocks, you know, you, you sometimes just can't get to the same places with those, right? Regardless what you do. So those are the ones that have a little bit more challenge to it. Um, so consider, consider, you know, it might be an opportunity for a lead, um, position to get rid of that rock first, for example, because sometimes the first rock of the end isn't a follow shot or always a follow shot. Um, you know, so you, you know, the line part may not matter. It can, you know, possibly just be, you know, taken into account with the icing for that shot. Um, but you might not be penalized as heavily all game with it. Um, you know, trying to get to a, a, a similar spot that your opposition had gotten to say on a freeze or something like that. Um, I, I, you know, some, sometimes, and I know it used to be the, the notion that you might pass that down or wait till it was a hit. Um, and I think you got to be careful about that in this day and age, just with the rule, the way it is and so much offense and things along those lines, um, you know, that opportunity just might not happen. And, and, you know, you don't want to kind of get stuck with something later on down the line for sure. So, um, so just careful on that, obviously, you know, if you're a team that's way, way up in the game and you know, there's going to be hitting, happening in the end um, because of that, then, you know, then that might open up that option for you as well. Or you might, you know what, the, you know, maybe there's a person on your team that just naturally with the way they throw gets more curl. And so all of a sudden, maybe it's not such a bad thing for them to have that stone, or if there's a couple stones like that, um, that might fit in just fine as well. Uh, also, so just certain things you can think about with, with that. Um, and then rocks that curl a little bit more, um, you know, and, and, and if the speed, speed is, is close to normal or, or reasonable, um, you know, those can be, those can be used as a weapon sometimes like that can be an advantage obviously, because, you know, you can now maybe get to places that your opposition may not, or it might open up some shots that may be more difficult for your opposition to follow as well. So, um, you know, sometimes back end will, will use some of those or different people may use some of those um depends on probably your players and athletes comfort level with with that as well um 
you know, and, and can be used for certain shots also. So that, that becomes a kind of a team and, and player comfort level, um, comfort level thing for sure as well. And again, all starts with detection and all starts with, you know, being technically proficient enough to be able to detect those things. Okay, so then we get to um, next on the list is tracking. So we touched a little bit on this kind of with rock book and making notes. Um, you know, when scouting teams getting kind of, you know, their their order of rocks a couple times during the game, you know, what they start with, but also kind of later on in the game, just to see if anything is switched as well. You know, and if you're watching a game, you can get some some information on on that too, just with respect to some chatter or or moving rocks in and out and things like we've got as well talked about um, uh, as well. So um, so yeah, again, just making notes on this. Um, you know, whether it be on a spreadsheet uh, or or something self made, but just whatever you whatever you need to do to kind of have a clear indication of of uh you know what you're tracking and what you're seeing and and for for future reference and information for you and, and your team basically on that and you can you know it's it, it that has even gotten to a point in, with some events like some events are are you know have full statistics in place and so if you have orders of of teams uh throughout that event um you can actually then you know, through the statistics of that, you can actually, you know, basically make or come up with, um, you know, the rocks performance through an event, you know, based on based on stats based on game or shooting percentages. Um, so, you know, taking it one step further, it's not just the person, but you actually can follow that rock all the way through the event and, and, you know, determine which ones of, you know, which rocks have actually you know, ended up being successful or made more shots, basically, um, you know, player, player aside even as well. Right. So uh, it, it, it's gotten to that point for sure. Even that's been happening for quite a while now where, where that, that happens. And that can be just another tool for, you know, selection of rocks kind of later on and, and, uh, or, you know, early warning system of questioning certain things potentially during an event as well, for sure. Uh, stone changing during games and events. So obviously ice flattens during the game or um, running surface kind of gets used during an event. Uh, and after, after, you know, the, the papering, you know, before the start of the event, for example, um, watch may not happen, but also may due to the factors uh, of the rock uh, or as a result of the ice setup uh, and changes throughout the event. So, and we, we already talked a little bit about that, but um, you know, you're not safe even through a game, let alone the entire event, right? And, and obviously things can change uh, in both instances. So always learning, always re-verifying, always going through your routines of rechecking when you can um, as, you, as you go. And then really learning to, you know, believe what you see um, when you're proficient enough at that as well, for sure. And we have then, a quick a quick question. Yeah. Does anybody know of an iOS app for tracking uh, curling, like a curling rock book or anything like that? I'm not aware of anything. I think journaling and yeah, and yeah. your rock. Book. No, there is. There is definitely a um, uh, Android app. I think it's called actually called Rock Book. And I, I do believe there's a charge for it, but uh, there's definitely a Rockbook app in Android. Okay. Good to know. Oh, and Google Sheets. Andrea, mm -hmm. um, Harry, uh, Rick Collins' wife, Sue Sulin, is a programmer, and she just released something on iOS ah. called Curly Rockbook. Okay. And I was actually in Ottawa last weekend and talking to them about what they're doing with it, um, their ideas and what they put into the first release and what they plan for the subsequent releases. So it's probably worth looking at for some people on the iOS, uh, uh, the, the phone as opposed to an iPad. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for that clarification, Rick. I misunderstood. So thank you. Um, and uh, Tina says Curling Rock book on the App Store. It's thirteen ninety nine. Yeah, perfect. So and all those things can kind of help you as far as as far as you know the entry and 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 keeping track of and and you know having quick reference to and whatnot, right? So absolutely. And then uh, obviously there's more and more with with certain events, not every event, but certain events we're seeing more commonplace. And I think we will continue to see this. Obviously, it seems to be going this way, but kind of the reconditioning or sanding of the rocks uh, mid event. And uh, so, again, just be aware, just be aware of that, obviously, um, that that, uh, you know, there could be some changes there, um, either either, you know, properties that you know, come out uh, slightly different ones or, you know, some some that were there before that may now be hidden just a little bit, um, uh, you know, with that. So again, having to do due diligence kind of after that uh, is the case as well. So, okay. And then kind of last on the management list is, is the stones versus ice piece. Um, this obviously, the importance of reading and mapping the ice as a skill is, is, is again, uh, a huge, a huge part of this. Um, you know, knowing the ice first to make proper judgment on the stones kind of line and weight is important. And, and yes, that's hard in a pre-game practice, but again, you know, having as much information and, and knowledge about what it what it is or what it has been say in a previous game or games uh, or your other you know pre-competition practices and things to uh, to get that figured out as much as possible obviously is really important but you know knowing the ice first before you make the judgment on the stones really really important obviously so uh like non-uniform curl, so more, more curl or straight um, can of course be caused by the ice qualities that can be the, the shape and leveling, you know, there's sometimes, you know, you find little ridges or scraper lines. Um, some, sometimes it's a little dished uh, on, the, on the sides just to allow a little more curl kind of as you get wider, um, uh, which may flatten out or, or be less so or, or show less curl as you kind of move into, you know, you know, eight foot area or, or edge of four foot kind of thing. Um, you know, so those are, those are not uncommon, a uh, high center line or, or four foot lines even, right? So just like little things, you still have to be, you know, really mindful where, you know, a lot of times we're pretty spoiled with such great, great ice and conditions. And it's, you know, it's, it's seemingly getting better and better that way, obviously uh, across the board, but um, still a lot of times there's little intricacies and little qualities that, you um, can obviously make a big difference in in you know what happens to the stones and where they where they come to rest obviously too so really important to to be able to again distinguish um which might be at work here as well um as much as possible for sure uh path sensitive weights so causing different uh weights so just again different paths again is the other piece of it it might not be the, the shape of the ice, but it just might be, you know, it's, it's heavier, you know, the six inches wider from this path than it is here, for instance, right? And, and obviously, you know, with the rocks, we're not just talking about line, we're talking about the weight as well, as far as um, being able to detect that. So again, knowing that uh, also that, uh, that that can be the case. And again, the importance of throws on the same paths um, all the way through pregame, pre-competition, uh, team and individual practices, getting good at that. And then all comes full circle back to technical uh, excellence basically with that, right? So how important that is to, to get as good as possible at that so that all this kind of pieces together for, for, for your teams and, and, uh, and athletes there for sure. So, so just a, a couple of things of note, kind of with with talking about all this. A couple of things of note that I just wanted to to mention. So, uh, first one I want to touch on is just accountability. So, um, this is what I mean by that is just the importance of being honest. And I'm talking about you know your teams in general and and players, but the importance of being honest with yourself and the teammates. Um, you know, technically with respect to line and weight related. Um, 
you know, removing human error first to piece together the puzzle, the rocks if necessary, right? So, um, you know, again, just just having that accountability and uh, peace in place, I think for for coaches, it's such an important thing to uh, to be aware of and to mention and, and uh, you know, get us to a point or get your teams to a point um, all together where you're all on the same page with that for sure. Um, second point, uh, just always learning. So always learning and gathering information on what you see. And as, as you can see, and as we've kind of talked about, there's so many, so many possibilities, so many little factors that play with this. Right. Um, and so, and, and, it's really a, a, an ever-changing situation when we're dealing with rocks and, and, and all the factors that affect them, the ice, the players and everything, right? So, um, so just, again, always learning, always paying attention, always watching, um, you know, getting the most out of your practices, whether it be, you know, at home, whether it be your pre-game practices, watching your opposition pre-game practice, and, and getting things out of that, learning from that, um, you know, all those things so very important. Uh, third thing, um, when, when possible, match on properly prepped ice or at the very least the best part of the sheet. And I kind of say that um, because, you know, that kind of leads us to, you know, the, the night practices, for example. So events where you've got night practices, you kind of head on out and, and, you know, you might, you know, get a chance to kind of throw or, or try and match the rocks for the, the team on the next day, basically. And uh, the ice is, is just left with what was there after the game, right? So that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge um, depending on, depending on uh, you know, the game and, and maybe how long the ice is sat before all the other games were off and just different factors there as well. So, uh, picking the best spot of the sheet. And I'll give you an example at the, at the Scotties this year, obviously um, uh, got to go out and do that at nights and, and uh, try and get some information. And, and there it ended up being kind of about that edge of four foot um, seemed to be the best, you know, where the ice had held up the best. And I think kind of makes sense with the way the game is played now a little bit um, you know, lots to the middle and, and where those paths are and things of that nature that, um, you know, you're not quite on the corner guard path. You're not quite on the draw to the button path. It's kind of, kind of tracked kind of almost in the middle of all that. So it seems to be a good, a good area where the ice was the best. So just a little tip there. If, if, um, you know, if, if you're in that situation, um, look for the area that might be the best still, uh, quality for you to, uh, to be as helpful as possible with that, basically. Um, I think too, it's also, a, and this is a really kind of a fine tuned little tidbit, but um, I think when matching rocks, it's good to throw whereby you have a little bit of angle first, um, that it's not, you know, you're maybe not throwing right up the center line where it's actually got the opportunity to kind of curl immediately, naturally, basically. Um, so kind of throw a, you know, where you have a little bit of natural angle first before, before the break point takes effect, um, just because a lot of the shots will be that way. And, and it gives a, you know, I think it just gives a little truer, um, uh, you know, without an amplified kind of difference uh, when, when the rocks come to rest at the other end as well. So, all right. Yeah. We have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, is it meaningful to determine that a rock curls an inch less than another one? What's a ballpark for line and weight one should be considering? Or yeah, good. so super question. Um, I don't know that I really have the answer to that because I think it kind of depends on how, how in tune and how good you are at this really, right? As a player or a team. Um, you know, the best teams, you know, certainly, certainly a, a, a piece of the stone line wise would be, can, can be detected and would be enough to, to be a bother for them, right? Um, you know, maybe even a little less than a half a rock width kind of thing, right? Uh, I would think. Um, and then weight, you know, we're probably looking at, a, you know, a couple feet probably, you know, kind of a difference um, is, is, you know, something that's not, you know, very easily kind of made up with the brushing, basically. Um, you know, a lot of times that little little bit is, but um, 
you know, the, the good teams will pick up on, you know, not a very big distance weight wise and certainly not a, di a big difference line wise for sure. Um, and when you have two good teams playing against each other, you know, and it's a, it's a game of inches for a reason. And, and uh, you know, even, even sometimes less than inches, I think we're getting to that point now, we're going to have to rephrase that probably, but yeah. um, it's, we're working with pretty small little areas for sure. Uh, one more question. Um, so are, t are some teams using the late night practice to match rocks or would they be using it more to confirm information that they had? Yeah. Oh, I think a lot of, a lot of teams do that. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of that. I know at the Scotties, there were a lot of teams doing that. Uh, I know at uh, previous Briars, there's certainly people doing that as well. Uh, when it's, when the conditions are good enough to get something out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. So, so that, yeah, that's just checking. Um, in a lot of cases at those night practices, you have an idea and it's just another layer of verification basically i would put it that way yeah i think the other thing to be mindful of pat maybe in um is that when you're scouting the opposition and they're not throwing in you know one two three four whatever that you don't know you may not know why they're throwing in another order yep for so, sure so take yep. it all with a grain of salt Hundred percent. Yeah, you may not know why. Um, you know, some things that other teams, you know, may think or say may not come to fruition just because it's a different person throwing it and throwing mm -hmm. it a different way, even right. So, yeah, yeah it, it really a lot of that scouting is, you know, maybe an idea or maybe a mm -hmm. inkling of a start point, but you have to do your own due diligence always because there are too many factors involved for sure. Um, you know, and that's where, that's where, when you get to a point where the teams are really good, really developed, um, you know, I urge, I urge those teams to, you know, not try and follow everybody, you know, you don't even need to necessarily get all the orders, but if you know, some teams that, you know, you just, you know, they're good at it, or maybe they throw similar to you, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, a team that when you've played them before, you can basically okay. take the same ice and get to the same spots, um, you know, you, you trust that they're technically sound enough to, to pick up on these things. Um, you know, all those types of things. Well, those are the ones you really, you know, that information is just more valuable for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so there's some thinking involved with that too. You don't, you don't just aimlessly kind of follow everyone necessarily because you know, there's some of those, some of those you're not gonna, you know, it might not help anyway. Uh, and you certainly don't want it being detrimental to you just, assuming as well right so um yeah there's there's always uh, those things to think about i guess when you're doing your scouting and and uh taking out information from other other teams or players for sure great thank you yeah you bet and i and, you know kind of the, the the two last points i had are are and we just touched on this one basically but stones seemingly match for one player may not be for another um you know, based on, based on how they throw. So really important to, to throw your own stones, right. Um, you know, when you're, when you're going through this process of trying to match or detect and, and what have you, um, I know, I know I've been with teams in the past where, you know, one person kind of just threw and, and thought it was right to just throw the whole set. And, and, uh, that's just because of that reason that can be just a little, I think dicey, uh, that can be just a little dicey. It's just really good if, if every, every person based on how they throw, uh, sees what they want to see or learns what they need to learn from, from those stones basically. So, and then just, I think to know that, and, and again, we're seeing this this week even too, right. But despite best efforts, despite, you know, being diligent and getting really good at all this stuff, um, everyone gets caught occasionally and that's just due to all the factors involved. Um, there really are no absolutes when it comes to the rocks. Um, you know, you just do your best, um, and, and, you know, you know, you have as much relative certainty as you possibly can. Um, but, but again, that can be ever changing, um, with, with games, events, um, you know, surroundings, ice, uh, player, so many different things, right? So, um, so always an open-mindedness, always, um, 
you know, willingness to kind of take in and, and learn the information as you see it, um, holding yourself accountable when that's necessary, you know, being good at the ice piece as well to rule that out, uh, and then just being as darn good technically as you possibly can get to basically that really is is still probably the most important piece um, for for everyone everyone playing for us coaches that that are uh, that are trying to uh, trying to help help the players along as well for sure so all right thank you so much pat are there any other questions or comments Well, thank you so much, Pat. This has been extraordinarily helpful, I believe. Um, it's something that we've been, or I've been thinking about for a long time and who to get and, and uh, you popped into mind. And so I'm so happy that you were able to be with us this evening. To well, thank, yeah, thanks. Share thank your you. knowledge. Yeah. yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, and so you know, you know what you have my contact, Andrea. So if there if, yes. if there are any questions, feel free to to have people or you know give my email or have people forward or or you forward, whatever the case may be. But if there's anything that kind of comes to mind at all, or or you're thinking about after, man, I would have you know, I wish I would have asked this or or this comes up, or maybe it's during the season or whatever something comes up. Happy to happy to have those conversations anytime. That's fun. So. So just, yeah, feel free to reach out and feel free, Andrea, to, to pass that stuff on and, and, uh, and yeah, happy to, happy to help out in any way I can and, and uh, all the best and best of luck with, with the teams and playing and, and uh, everything with the whole group for sure. Is there any chance that you would share the slide deck? Pat, please. Oh, for I, sure. Yeah, I can yeah. send that. 100%. If, you, yeah. if you send that to me, I'll send it out with the recording and I'll copy you on the email as well. So sure. um, everybody will have your email contact information. No, oh, sounds great. You bet. Okay. All right. Thank well, you so much. Thank you, everybody, for attending and stay tuned for the recording.